all the souls in it. Our Father, I stayed in heaven. Our Father, I stayed in heaven. Jesus said that we should become like little children in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Can you imagine anything reaching God more dynamically? Jesus spoke so often about our heritage as the children of God, obviously it was more than a figure of speech. He wanted us to come to him in innocence, honesty, eagerness, trust, no trappings, no pretense, just purity of heart in tandem with the will of God. If not the right words on our lips, but the untarnished love in our hearts that God asks in our prayers. Welcome to this edition of What Catholics Believe About Prayer. Hello, I'm Father Michael Tuith. God wants to hear from us. Nothing spectacular, just simple, honest-to-goodness love that comes from sincerity. In our sophistication, I think we sometimes get carried away with the hows and wherefores. And that's probably why we're overwhelmed when we hear Paul's exhortation to pray always. It's not as tall an order as we might think if we approach it as little children. No affectations, no public display, just simple, straightforward, honest love for our God and the desire to be in communion with God. Let's see how we can go about that. If you've watched any of the videos in this series, I bet you already know the first question. Ah, but do you know the first answer? Let's see. What is prayer? Raising one's heart and mind to God? Allowing God to know the depths of a human heart? A response in faith to the promises of God? A covenant relationship between a person and God? Which of these is prayer for you? The lifting of one's mind and heart to God in a loving relationship. Prayer is raising one's mind and heart to God. A definite covenant with God and oneself. Raising one's heart and mind to God. Good news. Everybody got this one right. Since you already knew the question, we thought you'd like knowing the answer, too. Each of the choices defines prayer as presented in Scripture, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, or the writings of a saint. But these are just a few of the definitions for the communication we call prayer. Serving as our guest expert is Father Maurice Nutt, pastor of St. Alphonsus Rock Church in St. Louis. And as you will see, quite a man of prayer himself. The Catechism speaks of belief in, celebration of, and living out of faith in personal relationship with God. Regardless of the definition, origin and focus of prayer are most important. Whether words or silence, gestures or thoughts, whatever form it takes, prayer must originate in the heart, a heart that longs to know God. Over a thousand times in scripture, the heart is mentioned as a source of prayer or relationship with God. St. John Chrysostom wrote that no matter where we happen to be, by prayer, we can set up an altar to God in our heart. Okay, prayer from the heart is living our faith in a vital and personal relationship with God. That's as general as it gets. Now we'll get more specific. What is the official prayer of the church? The Our Father, the Mass, the Liturgy of the Hours, the Sign of the Cross. Give it some thought while we hear what a few Catholics think about it. The Our Father. 
The Liturgy of the Hours. The Mass. Liturgy of the Hours. My guess is that this was tougher than it looked. You might be surprised to hear that the Liturgy of the Hours, or Divine Office, is actually the official prayer of the Church. Here's an explanation. The Liturgy of the Hours, which deepens our understanding of liturgy and scripture, answers the invitation to pray always. It's primarily a prayer of praise and petition offered at regular intervals each day. This prayer is a complement to the fullness of the divine worship contained in the Eucharistic sacrifice. It's intended to be the prayer of the whole people of God. Clergy, religious, laity, all who share in the dignity of the royal priesthood confer to us at baptism. Through the liturgy of the hours, all hours of the day and night are sanctified by the praise of God. Someone who praised the Liturgy of the Hours mentioned that for her, it's like keeping a finger on the pulse beat of the church. Okay, ready for another question? What prayer is the source and summit of all graces? The Mass, the morning offering, the consecration to the Holy Spirit, our baptismal vows. Which of these prayers do you think best answers the question? Here's some ideas. To me, prayer would be a, a, a definite covenant with God and oneself. Prayer, which is the source and summit of all graces, is the Holy Mass. The Mass. The source and summit of a, of a Christian life, and of a, especially of a Catholic life, is the Mass. Certainly all of the choices are sources of grace, but the quintessential source and summit of all grace is the sacred liturgy, the Mass. The Second Vatican Council defined the sacred liturgy, the Mass, as the action toward which the church is moving and the fountain from which all graces flow. Jesus, present in the Eucharist, is God's most precious gift to us and likewise our most perfect gift to God. St. Ignatius of Antioch explained that every time we celebrate this mystery, the work of our redemption is carried on we break the one bread that provides the medicine of immortality, the antidote for death, and the food that makes us live forever in Jesus Christ. The sacred liturgy is the pinnacle of prayer. They say movie special effects are better than ever. With advanced equipment, they record just about any audio effect they want in a studio. Computers talk, robots walk, all truly remarkable but we Catholics have the corner on spectacular. Too unspeakable for recording, too incredible for effects. We have the Mass. No computer chips, no robot components, just the God of the universe coming in quiet, unpretentious splendor as the gift we give and the gift we receive. About all there is to say is that God is good. Now let's take a look at prayer as we experience it in the scriptures, okay? In what book of the Bible is an interactive prayer relationship first actually revealed to us? Genesis, Exodus, Jeremiah, Job. There are references to prayer scattered throughout both Testaments of the Bible. Where is the first you can think of? I would say the Genesis. Exodus. Genesis. Genesis. If you chose Genesis for this one, good for you. As early as Abel offering the first fruits of his flock, prayer is evident in Scripture. Men like Enoch and Noah are pictured walking with God. Our foremost introduction to prayer, however, is the life of our father Abraham. Abraham was a man of prayer, whose faith was firm and unyielding, whose heart was open to the will of God at all times and in all circumstances. At each stage of his journey, Abraham built an altar of sacrifice to God. Abraham believed, he trusted, he gave his heart, his life to God. He interceded for others without thinking of himself. He walked in communion with God, and when God called, Abraham responded, here I am. Abraham wondered, but he never doubted. God's will was Abraham's delight. 
The interactive relationship between Abraham and God is our blueprint for walking in the Lord. What book of the Old Testament could be called the masterwork of prayer? The Book of Wisdom, Song of Songs, Proverbs, or Psalms? They're all pretty wonderful, but which one best answers the question? Psalms. Wisdom. Psalms. The Psalms. Michelangelo is to the Pietà as the author of Psalms is to prayer. It's truly a masterpiece. From the time of David to the present, those hymns have filled temples, churches, and hearts with a confession of faith in song. We've been taught to include in our prayer a combination of praise and adoration, contrition and repentance, intercession and petition, and thanksgiving. It's all right there in the Psalms. Our prayer should be personal and communal. The Psalms have it. They recall the past, hope for the future, and pray in the present from the deep recesses of the human heart. They speak for kings and peasants, grow from pain and exuberance, and are appropriate for people in every circumstance and time. The Psalms are timeless, ageless prayers of praise, which is what Psalm actually means. Where in the New Testament can we find the perfect model of prayer? Mary's fiat at the Annunciation, the filial prayer of Jesus, the Our Father, or the Gloria in Excelsis Deo, sung by the angels at the birth of Jesus. These are just four of the many references to prayer in the New Testament. Which best answers this question? Um, the Our Father would be an example of the perfect prayer. I would think it would be the Our Father. The most perfect form of prayer that we can find in the Gospels is the Our Father. The Our Father that Christ gave us is a perfect form. Certainly, each of these prayers represents a faith-filled relationship with God. But the perfect model of prayer is the filial prayer of Jesus offered in loving cooperation with the divine plan and in total commitment to the Father's will. Jesus prayed in solitude and in public. He prayed in praise and in gratitude. He prayed in reparation for his ministry and when exhausted from it. When he was at peace and when he was tormented, Jesus prayed. Regardless of circumstances, there was always one constant. Jesus always prayed in tandem with the will of his Father. When he taught us to pray, he said, Thy will be done. When the most devastating reality was imminent, he prayed that it could all pass away. But then he spoke from a heart engulfed with love, not my will, but yours, Father. Jesus was always faithful to the Father's will. What virtue is the foundation of prayer? Humility, faith, trust, love. Okay, pick your virtue. Trust would be, I believe, faith. Faith. Uh, I'll say faith. Faith, trust, and love are all components of prayers, but the solid foundation on which prayer is built is humility. God is always receptive to a humble and contrite heart. As we raise our hearts, our minds, in fact our whole being to our God, it must come from humility. There is no room for self-indulgence or ego in a relationship with God. Everything that comes to us through prayer comes as a pure gift from God. We earn nothing. We deserve nothing. St. Augustine explained that we are beggars before God. God could choose maybe to give us a sense of peace, the gift of a prayer language or tongues or deep inner joy, or God might be present in darkness. Whatever comes through prayer, we must approach the magnificence of God knowing that those who are humble will be exalted in God. Everyone has an opinion about personal prayer. Some even go so far as to say one way of praying is better than another. Are they correct in saying so? Let's take a look at individual prayer. Is it better for personal prayer to be spontaneous or formula prayers? Spontaneous, formula prayers, a combination of both, 
or praise your heart dictates whatever form it takes. What do you think? Is it better to make up the words yourself or to use some that somebody else already formulated, like saying the Hail Mary? Praise your heart di dictates whatever form it takes. I think it's whatever form it takes. Um, pray as your heart dictates whichever form, either spontaneous or formula. Well, I would say a combination of the last two. There's no better or worse method of prayer. Any communication with God is excellent communication with God. If you pray as your heart dictates, then you get an A+, plus, no matter how you go about it. Any prayer is certainly welcomed by God, who created us with all our idiosyncrasies. God put no restraints on how we pray. God just wants us to pray. It could be a fervent Hail Mary, a quiet request for help, a boldly sung Alleluia, communion with God in the wilderness where God's voice is a crunch of leaves and no words are spoken, a simple I love you in a darkened church where the only light is a flickering candle by the tabernacle. Maybe it's a journal entry or liturgical dance. The choices of ways to pray are limitless. However we go about it, we're asked to pray from the heart and really mean it. It's not uncommon to hear someone say, God doesn't hear my prayers, or God doesn't listen to me. Someone usually responds, don't feel like that, God listens. That brings up an interesting question. How can we know that God hears our prayers? Always pray for someone else, never yourself. Pray from a sense of need, not from a sense of want. Pray in the name of Jesus. Always ask for something that's good for you. Is there really any assurance that God hears prayers? Pray in the name of Jesus. Asking in the name of Jesus and praying for others, things that will help others. The way which we know that God hears our prayer is to always pray in the name of Jesus. Pray in the name of Jesus. At the Last Supper, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He further instructed us that anything we ask the Father, we should ask in his name. Thus, if we want our prayers to be heard, we should pray in the name of Jesus. Repeatedly in his last discourse, Jesus taught us to pray in his name. He assured us that when our prayers were united with his, the Father would send another Consular to be with us forever. Ask and you will receive, that your joy may be full. It's not a magic formula to get everything we order, but a merging of our will with that of the divine will. St. Augustine summarized the threefold dimension of Jesus' prayer. Jesus prays for us as our priest, prays in us as our head, and is prayed to by us as our God. Let us acknowledge our voice in him and his in us. Those are incredibly powerful words. The very name of Jesus is actually a prayer in itself. The relationship we intend to foster is between ourselves and the divine community of love we call the Trinity. So why do we pray to Mary and the saints? We worship them in conjunction with God. We want them to pray with us and for us. It's just kind of a mark of respect for people who have lived as Jesus commanded. They are able to answer our prayers. This is a question that comes up every now and then. How do you answer it? Well, we want them to pray with us and for us to God. I would definitely want them to pray for us. We want them to pray with us and for us. We want, the, uh, we want Mary and the, and the saints to pray for us and with us. While we honor the saints and respect them, only our triune God is the object of our worship, and only God can answer our prayers. Actually, we pray to the saints to ask them to intercede for us. We're all joined with Jesus in the mystical body. This communion of saints is made up of those still here on earth and the faithful who have gone before us, both those already in heaven and those expiating their sins in purgatory. Part of God's magnificent plan is for us to offer intercessory prayer for each other. 
Just as our sins and virtues affect the moral atmosphere of all of us, so too our prayers affect the rest of this body. Thus we ask the saints to intercede for us. Why not take all the help we can get? Thanksgiving is another integral component of a relationship with our God. Somehow it sometimes gets neglected a bit. Let's have a look at the prayer of thanksgiving. When is the prayer of thanksgiving appropriate? When we see something good even though we didn't ask for it? When we experience pain and suffering because we know that's when we grow in relationship with God? The Thursday in November? In all circumstances. What's a good spiritual rule of thumb to follow in thanking the Lord? In all circumstances. In all circumstances. In all circumstances, so all of the above. I would say in all circumstances. The first three are partially right. We should thank God for good things, requested or not. We do grow, though we don't always like it, through pain and suffering, especially when we unite our suffering with that of our loving Savior. But really, it's a good idea to thank God in all circumstances. Confused? Here's an explanation. The letters or epistles Paul wrote for both then and now frequently begin and end with thanksgiving. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Our sin disrupted God's magnificent plan for us. Without a moment of hesitation, God broadened the plan to include that Jesus would come and make us a new creation. Even in situations where we continue to suffer the innate effects of our own sin, the reality of Jesus and our salvation remains a constant. Therefore, we always have cause for thanksgiving. Let's look back for a minute. We've talked about prayer from a lot of different aspects. What form of prayer recognizes most immediately that God is God? Contrition, thanksgiving, petition, or praise? In what form of prayer do we most recognize the divinity of God? Myself, I would say praise. 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 Praise would, would acknowledge God's greatness in the most perfect form. Anytime we pray and in any manner in which we do it, we recognize God as God. But praise is the prayer that is for God's sake. Prayer of praise has nothing to do with us. It further has nothing to do with what God can do. Praise is glory to God just for being God. Praise encompasses all other forms of prayer and establishes our sense of awe before the divine community of love we call the Holy Trinity. We are the children of God brought to wholeness by Jesus the Christ who sent the Holy Spirit to fill us and guide us forever. God is God. No one or nothing compares to that reality. Praise be to God. Alleluia. Here's the perfect last question, because it's about the last word in prayer, or rather, the last word we say in many of our prayers. What does amen mean? Thank you. So be it. The end. It doesn't really mean anything. It's just a reverent way to end a prayer. How about it? Does amen have a meaning? And if so, what does it mean? It does have a meaning. It means kind of like it is or be it. Uh, amen means thank you and I believe. Amen means so be it. So be it. Amen is a word of affirmation. It means I agree. This is true. So be it. Because we speak it with such frequency, a man could become merely a custom, something we just do. But if we listen to our own thoughts and words at prayer, prayer in conjunction with another person who is praying with or for us or are attentive to God's message to us in prayer, a man is for more than a religious ritual. A man whispers, this is true. A man says, I accept this from my heart. A man shouts, I believe. Amen, it's his own little act of faith. Okay, now, what is prayer? I can hear you saying, 
He already asked that one. Well, yes, I did. But this time, it's a rhetorical question. For each of us, there's an individual variation on the same theme. For Mother Catherine Macaulay, a cup of tea was prayer. For Francis of Assisi, it was a walk in the forest. Mother Teresa holds a dying child in the Calcutta street and its prayer. Ignatius Loyola thought it followed a form. For the little flower, it was a surge from the heart that welled up and spilled into all of life. It can be a journal entry, a rosary, a meditation. Some pray in words, some in tongues, some in silence. No matter what form it takes, God's part is far more important than our own. So listening is the most important thing we can do. Thanks for being with us for What Catholics Believe. See you next time. <laughs> yes, yes. Suffer and succotash. It's a pinnacle of prayer. Oh, I, my favorite is the Indian guy who runs the uh, the 7-Eleven. Oh, you very good, very good, very nice. He's my favorite. <laughs> I can't do the show without my teeth. <laughs> Forget the makeup. <laughs> Sinners. Why, well, just last week I heard a man say, <laughs> I'm cheating up on the crucifix, and I said, you never said true words. Very nice.